Hi, I'm Nancy Howell with Western Cuyahoga Audubon, and I'm also uh, an employee here at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, and I have a, my pleasure of introducing Dr. Andy Jones, who is the curator and head of ornithology here at the, at the museum, and also the uh, director of science at the museum. So I'm going to let Andy talk a little bit about how we got involved with ornithology, birds, you know, interests how at, at a young age okay yeah i started at a very young age uh my first field notes were when i was five years old five wow i went out in the yard and counted uh fowler's toads in the front yard and wrote them down and my dad was encouraging me to kind of keep track in your of front yard was, was where in uh, raleigh north carolina north carolina yeah wow. yeah wow. so i actually started with reptiles amphibians and that was really after getting out of dinosaurs so i started with dinosaurs <laughs> at like age well, three or four which a lot of kids do around because you know the dinosaurs are there's some right. right on the grass over well there. and i took kind of a circuitous route so i started with the dinosaurs and reptiles amphibians and then fish took over hmm. and so wow. by middle school i had uh, 13 aquaria in my bedroom <laughs> Uh, that was the second floor bedroom, so we were always afraid we'd come home and my bedroom would be on the first floor, but that never happened. Uh, but I was keeping uh, things that I would buy in a store as well as stuff from the nearby creeks, and I started wow. getting really interested in what's in the backyard. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then by high school, I had to do a wildflower project, which I was not excited about, and, and ended up really enjoying it, and had to identify 25 species of wildflowers. While I was doing that, nice. um, a raptor flew over and I started yelling, hey, there's a bald eagle, there's a bald eagle. And my dad went along with me and said, yeah, it's a bald eagle. And my young cousin, who was maybe 10 at the time, said, no, that's an osprey. Oh, wow. And I thought, I'm not really sure what an osprey is, but it had a white head. It had to oh, be a okay. bald eagle. Yeah. And so I looked it up later and actually it had a black line on oh. its white head and he was right. And uh, so that was the first bird I had really officially paid attention to. Uh, that was maybe my freshman year in high school. And I got really hooked from there, started birding the backyard and, and seeing what else was around, and, and it totally snowballed from there. Wow. And so uh, natural history really grabbed me early. And in college, I started taking classes in genetics. And I thought that was some very interesting stuff, too. And, and it started, I started reading more about genetics and seeing that that could lead to telling you why one species would be split into two or why a genus name might change or a common name might change. And since I'd been keeping fish as a kid, I kept seeing fish names changing in magazines. Oh, yeah. And I was wondering why that was. Um, and then when I started getting into birds, that started, you know, I started seeing my field guides changing. So I, in my mind, I'm putting the genetics together with just the, the, the questions I had over or changing names. And that was where this current obsession wow. got going. Yeah, it and seems, has a, seems the way it, it's going with the, with the genetics and looking at uh, who's, who's related to whom. For sure, yeah. 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 That's neat. Um, now, you have collections. Mm -hmm. How many birds are in the Cleveland Museum of Natural History's so, collection? So we have about 35,000 specimens. Uh, a little over 30,000 of those are what we call round skins. And that is where you you essentially take everything out of a bird, you put cotton inside and sew it up, and you don't pose it like taxidermy, you lay it on its back. And so that's where you open up a cabinet and there might be a tray with maybe 100 black-capped chickadees in it, um, all laying on their backs. They have tags attached to them, which give the data, which is what makes them really important for us uh, for research. So uh, the vast majority of our collection is round skins, and then we have a few thousand um, complete skeletons and uh, we actually have a, a group of dermestid beetles that live in our basement that wow. you've seen yep. um, that uh, strip all the meat off of the skeletons and we uh, once they're clean we can save a complete skeleton for research uh, and we also have a few thousand eggs and nests wow wow uh, so so the how about how about the birds that are mounted you know posed at you know with eyes and and posed is that in the equation here or? It's, Technically, it's not. Okay. So if you if you walk through our, our building, what you see for the public is is taxidermy mounts. Uh, they usually don't have any data associated with them, and so they're really we kind of help curate them, but it's really under the purview of our exhibits folks. Those are are mounted for aesthetic and education reasons, and a researcher couldn't do a whole lot yeah, with okay. them. Right. We have a few kind of edge cases. We have a few birds that were collected in the 1920s. 
uh, and they were posed in a lifelike way, but then they have a tag attached to them. Huh. And so okay. they're actually really high value for wow. research, wow. but they still look great, so we can use them for exhibits <laughs> yeah. too. Yeah. And do you get collections in from uh, other organizations? Like I think there's some colleges that may have donated things as well. Yeah, so our, our collections still grow, mm -hmm. and some of that is through donations. Um, our most significant growth recently that way was the Kingman Museum in Michigan. Um, they are a smaller museum and decided it doesn't make sense for them to have a thousand research specimens and so they donated their whole collection wow, to nice, us. Wow, nice, real nice. Um, and occasionally, you know, somebody is cleaning out the, the attic of their parents or grandparents and they suddenly find ten grouse or something up there that have been mounted and if they have data, that's actually something we do oh, occasionally okay. take on. A lot of times they're just dusty and don't have much data, yeah, so right, they're, they're right, not for us. Right. Um, so, you know, we get people curious about, well, why did they have to kill these birds? Why are there so many of a particular, like, chickadees in a, in a drawer? Yeah. Um, you know, why can't they take photographs? So, mm -hmm. so what's the purpose of these collections, and, and how are they used here and maybe some, by somebody else? Yeah, so we're here to document diversity. Uh, we document today's diversity, and we also document the history of diversity. So. We have house sparrows in our collection, and people don't get very excited when they see house sparrows, but we have house sparrows from the last few years. We have house sparrows from the early 1900s, and if you lay them in a tray side by side, you obviously can see the 100-year-old ones because they were keeping warm by getting up against buildings in Cleveland, and the soot from the buildings wow. just covered them in, in sort of this dusky layer of huh. junk. And so that tells you a little bit about uh, changing air conditions and uh, uh, climate conditions. Mm -hmm. um, we have been talking with a student who's wanting to come by and take almost like a piece of scotch tape and stick it to some of the feathers, peel off that particulate matter, and then they can actually put it under a microscope and quantify wow. the kinds of gunk that was getting wow. in the house sparrows. Wow. Wow. And, so, pe and into people, too, so you could kind of correlate well, sure. to what yeah. people were breathing in. Yeah, Holy so the, the birds were putting their heads right in the middle of it, but people were working right downtown, too. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, and so that's, that's one little example of the kind of work that can be done with these specimens. But um, we can't do that with just five specimens. We need lots of individuals within a species. And so the black-capped chickadee example, I think, is a good one. Um, we have probably three or four hundred black-capped chickadees in our collection. Some of those are very recent, some uh, go back more than a hundred years. And so we can use them to look at change through time in that species. Yeah. Uh, we also use it to look at changes from place to place. So we have them not just from the Cleveland area, but from Michigan, from Minnesota, from Colorado, from North Carolina. And just like people don't look the same from place to place, black-capped chickadees do not look the same as you go from place huh. to place. Um, and That's so, interesting because, you know, you look in a field guide, you look at a bird, well, it's a black-capped chickadee. They yep. look all the same. Yeah, they, they do on, on first brush, mm -hmm. but when you start looking at them, and then a lot of times we're doing more specific measurements. Sure. Um, and on a lot of our black-capped chickadees, we've actually cut one of the wings off of the specimen. We completely spread it open and it's it dries out like that and you can actually measure every single feather on the wing. Uh, we're doing that to look at sort of uh, dispersal ability. If you have a long pointy wing you can disperse a long wow. way. Wow. If you don't have that kind of wing you don't disperse as far. Hmm. That's interesting. Uh, and so yeah, we, we want to uh, show changes through time. We want to show variation from place to place. And then we also want to preserve this because we don't know how people are going to use these specimens later. Um, my favorite example is the peregrine falcon story with the DDT and DDE and dieldrin, where these pesticides were introduced to the ecosystem, and eventually that made its way into the prey base of the peregrines. That interfered with their ability to put calcium into bone structure as well as their eggshells. Oh, wow. So when they try and incubate their eggs, they were cracking their eggs open. Of course, this is in the mid-1900s. Um, and so we had kind of the smoking gun story, right? The DDT connection with thinner eggshells. But we needed to go to a natural history museum to show that there truly was a thinning of eggshells through time. Wow. And so we needed eggshells from the late 1800s, the early 1900s, and the mid 1900s. And so researchers did that. They went to natural history museums wow. and pulled these eggshells and measured how thick they were. And that showed absolutely there's a 
the eggshells were the same thickness for decade after decade, and then all of a sudden you introduce these pesticides and the eggshells got thinner. Yeah. And some poor schmuck had to climb down a, the face of a cliff in the 1800s to retrieve one of these eggs. And they were doing that for a research project that would take place decades after they wow. themselves yeah. passed away. Who would, who would have thought? They, they were studying a, a technology that didn't exist yeah. yet. Yeah. And Absolutely. so every time we prepare a specimen, we think this could be really important for a project tomorrow or a hundred years from yeah. now. Wow. Yeah. Who, who thinks that far ahead now? Yeah. Should, and uh, with climate change, are we seeing any differences with bird movements, uh, birds staying here at certain times of the year? Mm -hmm. So how, how has climate change seemed to be affecting uh, certain species? So it depends on the kind of bird that we're talking okay. about. They, there are responses happening. And so if you're a bird like a song sparrow or an eastern phoebe, you might migrate maybe a few hundred miles south. And the weather that you experience in the winter is probably related to what's happening on the breeding ground. So whatever's happening in the Cleveland winter is not too far off of what's happening in Kentucky or Tennessee. Okay. And so if we get an early spring here, that's going to also be something they can detect on their wintering mm -hmm. grounds. So they migrate earlier in the spring and they can respond to changing climate mm -hmm. conditions. Wow. If you're a long distance migrant that's going to Central or South America, like a Blackburnian warbler, wow. whatever you're experiencing in, in uh, December and January has nothing to do with what's happening in Cleveland. And so they can't change their behavior based on the weather they experience okay. that winter. They have to have a genetic change that changes what day they wow. migrate north again. Wow. And that's asking a lot. That's asking a, a lot of uh, genetic change in a lot of species and, you know, Climate change is getting faster, so yeah, we're right. expecting so a the, lot and out of it. And the genetic change is not quite as fast. No. you got to go through generations. For sure. Yeah, yeah. so wow, wow. Yeah. And so we're, we're seeing mismatches. We see some of these birds are coming back a little earlier in the spring, but not early enough. And that means that the insects have already exploded in the spring and early summer, and they sort of reach a peak, and the babies need to be hatching right at that time so there's lots of food out there but if the birds haven't returned early enough the food has already reached its peak and started dropping off and wow. so they raise fewer young wow. and that's been shown definitively in several uh, fly catchers in, the, in Europe. That is really interesting wow uh, it's it's amazing how everything just so tied together sure, sure. You know, the plants the insects the birds the weather climate it's just is crazy. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. That's what I love about biology. It's just so tied together that, you know, once you start pulling something, once you start changing something, everything just seems to go kaflooey. Um, <laughs> what, what words would you have for, let's say, somebody that's maybe not so much into birds mm -hmm. that, you know, how can we protect them? What, what would be the best thing for, for us, you know, just a person in the neighborhood? How do you deal with people in the neighborhood? In the neighborhood, uh -huh. well, yeah, it's uh, it's it's still the uh, uh, think global, act local. Is I think it's still a, a great mantra. There, there's climate change is a global problem, and we can't all go and have global solutions. We're going to have to do things in our neighborhoods, and some of that can be really simple things, depending on the maybe the bird you care about. If you're like me, you think woodpeckers are just the coolest uh -huh. thing around. Uh -huh. So I have a half-dead oak in my yard, and I'm leaving it alone because mm -hmm. that's food for woodpeckers. Okay. That's a really basic level thing, right? But there are bigger picture things like uh, recycling, uh, uh, buying recycled products as much as you can, uh, thinking about your own diet. You want to minimize your impact on the earth as much as you can. And you really... I hate to say it, you have to research every every decision yeah. you're making at this wow. point. Yeah. Uh, what you're buying, how you're using it, what you're throwing sure. away, right. everything's got an impact. Yeah, it really does. That's, that's phenomenal. Um, so, birds, nests and eggs, um, what, what do you have as far as nests and eggs? Oh, what, you know what, I, what's the biggest bird that you have in the collection? The biggest bird is an ostrich. Oh, an ostrich. Yeah, we have a full specimen. It's. Uh, it would be too large to fit into our cabinets, except when they prepared the bird, they actually 
uh, folded the legs underneath it and put the head on top. It's a very awkward looking ostrich, but that's the only way we can preserve it. And did that it. was that collected somewhere it's or actually, was it a zoo? It's a Cleveland Zoo. A zoo, yeah. yeah. So when the birds pass away at the, the zoo and at local rehab centers, they okay. freeze them and they give them to okay. us. All right. So we yeah. can still make uh, research sure. specimens yeah, that's, from them. That's good. Yeah, as long as there's data. Yes, yeah. exactly. As long as yep. there's data. And they're very good about that. Good, we've, good. We've good, had good. lots of conversations uh -huh. to, to. How about the prepare. tiniest? the smallest? We have a lot of hummingbirds. Okay. Uh, we have hummingbirds from all over the Americas. Uh, we do not have uh, the, the uh, Cuban uh, bee hummingbird. Okay. We, we have a few that are closely related to it though and they're, I mean, they're just ridiculously <laughs> tiny. Yeah, yeah I actually uh, uh, was storing one of them in the cabinet with the ostrich just oh. so when I showed people through the collection I could pull out the little hummingbird yeah, exactly. right next oh, to the that's, ostrich. That's fantastic. You know, you have that huge diversity of huge things like ostrich through the littlest things like the hummingbirds and, and some of the kinglets and warblers. And right, right. Fantastic. This is amazing. Um, anything else that you're, you're concerned about that you would like to share with uh, uh, maybe just the lay public? Uh, in terms of? Just the birds in general. So, yeah, climate change is a sort of the overarching problem that dominates what we think about nowadays. So I'm, I, I am interested in taxonomy and systematics because I want to know how many species of birds there are in the world and where they occur. And if we want to preserve them, we have to know the basics, how many there are and where they are. And climate change is making all this more complicated because things are kind uh. of shifting around. Um, but that's not the only issue. We have to think about habitat loss and, and lots of other local management issues. So, uh, I, I don't know, I guess my, my answer is there, there's a lot of interrelated, yeah. complicated yeah. problems. Uh, a lot of this relies on people keeping up with the news yeah. and uh, paying attention to local, you know, what impacts are, are happening in your home city and in your own county and can you, uh, is your voice something that could really help uh, change the way things are being managed? How are you getting your research out to, again, the public? So when I complete a study, it has to go through peer review. Um, so if I make a discovery or you know describe a new pattern or process, um, that goes to a journal to get reviewed by scientists. And assuming they don't all thumb their nose at it, then it might get revised and eventually okay. published. Once that's happened, it's out for the sort of academics of the world to see, which is not the full audience mm -hmm. we're after, right? right. And so. Uh, we have a great relationship with our marketing and communications folks at the museum. Uh, we publish our member magazine, which okay. highlights really all the research happening at the museum. And then depending on the nature of the work, we may also start doing press releases and, and putting things out for uh, local papers or, or uh, a lot of internet science yeah, okay. uh, websites okay. as well. So, yeah. And I know you do programs for organizations. Yeah. I don't know I, if that's it's super lucrative, but at least it gets it out to, to the, the public. Yeah, I, I really, uh, I mean, I'm a birder as well as an ornithologist, so I know a lot of the birding groups in the region. I've spoken to a lot of the Audubon societies in, uh, well, northern and central Ohio at okay. this point, and, and I've worked a lot with Ohio Ornithological oh, sure. Society and a lot of other groups. And, uh, yeah, I give a lot of public lectures, and I think it's important. Plus, yeah. I enjoy doing it. Yeah, that's great. Fantastic. Wow. Well, I don't know. The, the birds, we tweet, we, we, we use bird terms all the time, and so birds are very, very much part of our, our environment. They're, they're the canaries in the coal mine as we're figuring things out, and uh, we've already learned a lot about how our environment has, is changing, how we might be able to protect it, and we still need to do more, so I'm um, hoping that we can all do that just a little bit right around your neighborhood. Thanks.